Okay, so welcome everybody to my presentation about uh, reproducible self-publishing via Python text, so Python and LaTeX. Uh, these slides, which we're going to see now, uh, are basically a reference implementation of the technology. So they're made with the technology and they demonstrate the technology, meaning that in addition to listening to me, you might get the best understanding of what I'm talking about and also be able to reproduce it locally by cloning the repository. If you don't want to copy this, uh, this link, I sent it to you all via Telegram. So you can just click it in the Telegram group. So let's get started. What do we actually want from free and open source publishing? What do we want publishing to look like? Well, we want a number of things. First of all, we want transparency. But I think it's very important to remember why exactly it is that we might want transparency. I mean, transparency and reproducibility have been hailed quite a bit these days, and rightly so. But I think it's important that we don't let these words become a sort of a mantra. Why do we need transparency? And the reason is we want research to be verifiable. You're trying to make statements about the real world, so you need to document what you did very precisely so that people can check it. Of course, you could do this by writing your method section very thoroughly, but why describe what you have done instead of just show what you have done? Uh, sure, uh, verifying that something is true might work even better if you can rerun it, but that's like an asterisk. So transparency is what mainly uh, provides verifiability. Reproducibility is something else which we totally want is there so that, they can, so that it can make things hackable. Basically, if things are transparent, you can check them for whether or not they're correct. Uh, reproducibility becomes much more relevant, not for that, it just automates the checking, uh, but for the case where you really want to be able to hack the work that's been done. That's where it becomes very relevant that you can run things locally in your own environment under your own control. I think thinking of this like that will help you avoid some of the common mistakes such as using Docker as a package manager, which I know that very many people do. And of course, as we've heard in a previous talk today, a big advantage of publishing your publications as code as opposed to as binary documents uh, is not just transparency, which means that you see everything that goes in them, and reproducibility, meaning that other people can compile them, but you also get all of the rich features uh, which the, the Linux environment and the free and open source environment provide you for text files. So basically this becomes uh, version manageable, you can diff your versions, you can blame your versions, you can collaborate much more efficiently with other people and also with your most important collaborator, which is you from a half a year in the future. Um, of course, it's not just free and open source publishing, it's also it's not just open source which we care about, it's also freedom. I mean, I hear about open science a lot, very many people seem to forget the free aspect. And of course, we would like to publish in a distributed model where there's no central nexus where we have to aggregate things and where there's like a decision maker who lords over us, but where we can uh, interact with each other in a completely flat distributed fashion. Uh, this removes the barrier of entry. You don't need your fancy credentials. You don't need a lot of money to publish, meaning citizen science can finally become a reality. It removes institutional bias. I mean, of course, we like to think that there's no such thing, but as you've seen also with Google and Facebook platforms which share information might uh, selectively censor information which they don't like. Uh, thankfully, publishers deal in fact more than in opinion, but who knows, right? Uh, and of course, we would have less publication bias simply because if you don't have to pay for the publication, it becomes less uh, of a weird thing to expect of people to publish negative results. Because if publishing things just, just takes you one weekend, you're a lot more likely to publish something which you're not sure is going to be high impact than if a publication takes you a month, right? Uh, and of course, you get direct market access, meaning that you don't have to go through the publisher, which I'm going to get back to on the last slide, but the publisher used to be an enabler. Uh, right now, the, like an enabler for you to communicate, but right now the publisher more often is a barrier from your com for your communication. Um, and of course, you want to publish in a presentable format. And the presentable formats are fairly limited. These are articles, posters, and slides. Most prominently, notebooks are not presentable formats. They are optimized neither for presentable quality, so for high quality typesetting, using the space efficiently, nor actually for development, as we've heard uh, a couple of hours ago from Antonio, right? Uh, they're basically a runtime environment with very many interesting features, uh, but they're neither well suited for publishing nor for development. So if you're looking to bring development and publishing together, the notebook might actually be a stopgap and not a format which you should converge on. So there's a lot of acumen regarding how you could integrate things so that they look nice for presentation, and all of that has been archived over years and years and years in the wonderful technology which we call text. 
So it's best to leverage that technology to provide to, to produce really beautiful documents with high resolution, which people can share and inspect, which people can print at high resolution, present at conferences, and basically get their information across a lot more beautifully and efficiently. Uh, so look at, let's look at a couple of the features which I'm talking about, right? So the idea is to take Python code, simply link it inside the LaTeX document, not, not even write it in the LaTeX document, just link it, and have the figures be produced directly in the LaTeX document. You don't need to copy them, you don't need to keep track of binary figures, but the code and the output is tied directly together, no stopgap. What could that look like? Well, you could have a 3D figure, which you can, which you don't export to anything. Basically, this 3D plot is generated each time this document is compiled, meaning that if I change anything about the figure, it's going to be updated the next time I, uh, I uh, recompile the document without me having to save it, drag and drop it, copy it, or anything like that. The same goes for um, other figures. For instance, here you have a lot of nodes where you want to align the labels with the, with the lines, and all of those stay in place, so basically we leverage Massplotlib very efficiently. We don't introduce any distortions when we place everything directly into the document. We can also plot some of the fancier figure types in Massplotlib, anything you want, really. Uh, and, of course, we can do the coolest thing about LaTeX. Anybody who's ever used LaTeX hates tables, uh, but we can print a really nice book, uh, book tabs, I think is the, the name of the package, style table directly from a pandas data frame. Uh, which uh, eases a lot of your work in LaTeX in excess of just making it more streamlined and more reproducible. Yeah? You don't need to type the LaTeX table anymore. You just link it to your data frame. And, of course, sometimes less is more. Uh, and I think the most revolutionary thing which we can do uh, isn't even all of this, but it's this. And you might be like, okay, well, it's a line of text. I can write a line of text. I can type these things in. No. These are statistic outputs generated from a Python script, meaning that you can inline your statistics so that you, if you ever update your data, your top-level data from which the statistics get compu computed, uh, this gets automatically updated in the text and in the figure at the same time when you recompile. Uh, the source code for all of these things looks fairly easy. So, for instance, to put the radar plot inside, inside the Python tech, uh, inside the tech, tech document, you simply have this line, which links the figure, adds the label, and can optionally add a caption. Uh, in order to link the, to create the table, you have basically this, this snippet of code, which again has a, a link to the, um, to the script, which interprets the table, a label, a caption, options if you want to control the text size. So basically the options just get inlined with the latex code, and of course the destination of your data. We're going to get to the data uh, in a second. And for the statistics, you simply uh, link the statistics analysis script, which in this case is an ANOVA. So what does, uh, how do all of these things integrate? Well, let's, let's take a peek at the framework, framework topology. Basically, if you've cloned the repository, you have all of that structure locally. What I'm showing you there is how the files relate conceptually with the blue boxes representing the directory hierarchy. So the outmost box is the top level, yeah? Um, and basically, this structure helps you reduce duplication by only keeping the scripts in the same place. So you might want to have different formats, like you might want based on the same... Um, scientific work which you're doing to have a presentation, to have a poster, and to have an article. And ideally, if you're using the same scripts, you are linking the same scripts. You're not duplicating the code. And this is what happens here. So, for instance, you have the top-level article tech, uh, tech file, which links to a header in its subdirectory where it keeps all of the, its things, such as styling and so on. And other sections might link to all of these scripts. The same thing would, could be true for the poster and, of course, for the slides. Uh, ideally, you also wouldn't duplicate um, text content. So, for instance, if the abstract, if you have the same abstract in the article and in the poster, you don't place it in their subdirectories, but you place it on the top level of the hierarchy. And the only bit which might look confusing is this part here with all of the lines. This is basically a many-to-many -many association. So you have these files can all link to, uh, to all of the scripts. And, of course, sometimes you might need data for the scripts to work on, and you have another data hierarchy which some of the scripts might call upon. Uh, now, the question is where you get your data. So what's the workflow behind this topology? And the workflow looks a bit like this, uh, simply because very often, although you could trigger the entire process from compiling the LaTeX document, very often uh, a lot of your work is very time intensive, so it won't actually help you work faster if each time you recompile your LaTeX document, you have to work, wait for three days because that's how long it takes your pipeline to go from scratch. So to mitigate that, the workflow which I use for a number of projects where I need to do a lot of analysis work 
is to have this two-tiered system where I offload basically all of the time-consuming analysis to a separate iteration stack, yeah, which ends up generating a set of, of top-level data based on which I can do plots and statistics in the document, yeah? So this is basically an asynchronous execution where I have low iteration for the time-consuming things and high iteration for the actual document with the absolute top-level analysis where I might want to tweak a lot of things and be very fancy about it. And if this seems like you've already heard this, it's because if I've counted correctly, there's at least three people who have presented something very similar, this, uh, this EuroSciPy. And I think that's a good sign. It shows that we're converging on a common solution. So ideally, we should try to establish this more if we already agree on this sort of organization and code to document time. Uh, the last part is, of course, uh, if you look here, you also have these dependency stacks because no software exists in the void. So you need to document what kind of things the software uses. And we also do this. If you've cloned the repository, we have a file which documents this. It basically specifies the compile time dependencies, which in this case there are none, and the runtime dependencies in a standardized format, which is the package manager standard. And this is because dependency resolution should be handled by a package manager. It should not be handled ad hoc by a bash script, which is basically what a Docker file is. So ideally, if, if you're unsure about package managers, you can pick one. There's very many of them, and you can use them. And whenever you have a project, you just have a file where you document the dependencies specifically for the package manager. And each RepSAP iteration, so each publication, research pub, uh, each collection of research project publications, which you would, re which you would use RepSAP for, uh, should carry such a file inside. It doesn't need to be for the PMS, but I strongly recommend the PMS to anybody who's interested in package managers. So what does this mean for you specifically? Well, uh, it means that you can co-author the reference implement implementation. I don't just talk about openness and transparency and, and flat uh, structures and hierarchies. The presentation is written, but ideally we also want to publish this, not just in this distributed system, which we're trying to establish, but also in a more, um, how, how do you say it, in a more established journal uh, in, order to, uh, in order to generate credibility for the project. But the article is not yet written. So the reference implementation at this moment only exists for the, for the slides, not for the article. So you can contribute, or if you think you can do this a lot better than me, you can just clone it, fork it, and publish it yourself as the first co-author. This is what uh, Flat Organization is all about, the best solution making it through, not the guy who had the idea having a monopoly on the project forever. So if you want to contribute, you can contribute in any way you want just by going on GitHub. And of course, there's more. Uh, if you're really interested in research, you probably do research on the side. Like, I'm not trying to convince any of you to publish your real research primarily over RepSAP because you're going to take a hit in credibility. I'm not encouraging anybody to torpedo their career that way. Uh, but if you have research which you can't publish because maybe you don't think it's quite serious or well elaborate enough, or you've done a questionnaire outside the university so you don't have the ethics committee stamp, which a lot of publishers require, uh, you can use this technology to publish in a better and more advanced fashion your least exposed work. So you can use this to garner visibility for the things which in the current system are rendered least visible. Um, when I was born, uh, a researcher had no chance of getting to the public outside of the publisher system. That was your gateway to the world. Um, right now, as I said very often, they're a barrier because they have paywalls. Uh, maybe you know some interesting things about the Elsevier logo. Um, it's basically an elm tree with a vine growing on it, and the sense of it is uh, the vine of, of knowledge, the fruits of knowledge, can't stand on their own. It says here, non solus, not alone. So they need the strong elm tree of the publisher to latch onto. Yeah? Another interesting thing, thing about this logo is it's almost 400 years old, and it belongs to a company which is not Elsevier, meaning that Elsevier doesn't have copyright on it. They might have copyright on a lot of things, but not on this glyph which they use for their logo. So I think you know exactly where this is going. If uh, Pay for Paywall has a logo, why shouldn't direct market access have one? And of course, we do. So thank you very much. Thanks for nice talk. Just an idea. Another way to interact with text from Python would be to use the template engines, like Jinja, which I usually use in, in web programming. 
And um, wouldn't it be possible to use more Python code and basically not even touch any LaTeX and use Python to generate basically uh, text, um, text files? So I, yeah, you could use Python to generate the text files, though I'm unsure whether you're saving more time that way, like basically by, by making a wrapper I mean, I'm, of I'm, text in Python. I'm more comfortable with Python than with, with LaTeX, I have to say, or text, so... I mean, I'm very comfortable with, with both, but even I am more comfortable with Python than with tech. However, I think that tech won't get easier if you wrap it in Python than if you use it directly. I've made that experience with R and RPy. Uh, I, I mean, you can try to use that, as I said, uh, fork and go. If your idea is better, it might get more citations. Uh, but I think that that would be an additional it, step it, of complexity. It's not, it's not my idea. I have seen people using it so basically okay. to automate uh, the process of generating uh, uh, text files, basically. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, to each his own, but for me, I think it's simpler this way. But uh, everybody is welcome to use their own technology stack with this, yeah. I don't know if you're uh, considering introducing some kind of a blockchain behind it, because it would be nice to have a publication which uh, is a certified author with data and code and text fixed in time. So every time everybody knows where mm -hmm. it's coming from and what it's about. I've actually heard the suggestion a number of times, and I think it might be a very good idea. The only problem is uh, I'm not very savvy in terms of blockchain and certification, but if you are, or if you know someone who is and who would like to contribute such a feature, I would definitely welcome it, yeah. And one comment. Okay. One comment on that. Um, it might not be necessary to go all blockchain. If you've gone to uh, content addressing, you would have the verifiability. Basically, like, like Git is a content addressable system, and that might give you the properties that you actually care about, unless you care about like financial incentivization and all this other things that usually come with blockchain. Yeah, I mean, uh, I get the point. I think the entire financial part on top of this is a challenge. I mean, right now it's so easy to give things away, so I think the main challenge for the publication of the future is, one, establishing the technology, but two, somebody has to host all of these things and make some money. So at some point we'll have to figure out how to make money by giving things away. But uh, I guess that's a bit getting ahead of the project. Are there any more questions? If not, then thank you very much. Thank you.